bringing EQ to AI. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Rana El Kalubi, co founder and CEO of Effectiva. Welcome, Rana. Hi, thank you for having me, Tanya. Absolutely. Remind us again uh, what Affectiva does and why you started the company. Um, so Affectiva is on a mission to humanize technology. We basically build algorithms using computer vision and speech analytics that understand human emotions, cognitive states, behaviors, and really like how do humans communicate and connect with one another. And we believe that technology absolutely needs to have this kind of emotional intelligence. You use the term human-centric AI. In fact, you have an entire event built around that. Let's start by defining what human-centric AI is. Yeah, human-centric AI. So I like to say when we are building and thinking about artificial intelligence, it should really be about the humans and not about the artificial, right? And so um, our theme for the summit this year, which is the third time we're having the summit, um, is human-centric AI. So human-centric AI is this idea that we're putting humans at the center of artificial intelligence. It's not really about the artificial, it's really about the people we're designing this AI for. Um, so when we think about human-centric AI, it's everything from the design to the development to the deployment of artificial intelligence. And how do we kind of switch the thinking to really focus about the people that the AI is designed to serve? Explain the relationship between how much AI knows about us and how useful it will be to us as individuals. Exactly. So as you think about, so AI is becoming more and more mainstream. And in fact, it's taking on roles that were traditionally done by humans, right? It's starting to drive our vehicles. It's acting as our healthcare companions, our learning companions. It's maybe helping you, you know, helping assist with your scheduling and helping you be more productive and safer. So as AI takes on more of these roles that were traditionally done by humans, it really absolutely needs to understand people at a fundamental level. And a lot of the focus in the AI rhetoric has been around the IQ or what I call the cognitive intelligence of these AI systems. And nobody's really focused on the emotional or social aspects of, of, of AI and how does it really communicate and connect with people. Uh, so we're all about bringing EQ to, uh, to the AI equation um, so that AI interacts with, pe with people in a more effective way. As a major player in the automotive space, what are examples of how human-centric AI can improve personal transportation? There's two aspects that are really critical. One, uh, it's very close to my heart, is around safety. Um, so if you think about, even with increased automation, um, the number of accidents is actually going up because people are more distracted, they're perhaps more frustrated with the automation in the vehicles, and they're, they're definitely, um, uh, yeah, distracted and frustrated and, and fatigue. We see a lot of examples of drowsiness. So one use case is to use our technology to detect in real time signs of distractions and drowsiness and then have the car intervene in real time. So you could imagine if a driver is falling asleep and this vehicle has semi-autonomous capabilities, then the car could actually say, you know what, at this moment in time, I'm going to be a safer driver than you are, and it can take control over. So that's a really key application and use case for the technology. Another is around this handoff challenge between uh, a code pilot or a driver in a semi-autonomous vehicle. Um, in a semi-autonomous world, uh, for example, you know, if you think of a Tesla, as the vehicle is driving itself, it may run into conditions where it needs to transfer the control back to the driver or the co-pilot. And in this case, you need this mutual trust and, and mutual communication going two ways between the vehicle and the driver. Um, and that includes understanding the state of the driver. Is the driver paying attention? Is the driver asleep? Is the driver, you know, on their phone? Are they in a state where they can actually relinquish control back from the vehicle and vice versa? Uh, so that's a really key um, application. And then as we kind of um, see the, um, the world of autonomous vehicles unfold with robo taxis, um, it's all going to be about the transportation experience. It's going to it's not going to be about the driving anymore, right? And so there's an opportunity with our in-cabin sensing technology to understand how many occupants are in the vehicle, what's their demographic, are they interacting with each other, what's the general sentiment of the, of, of the, of the cabin, 
Um, and then you can personalize and optimize and even monetize that driving experience. To what degree should we be skeptical or cautious about letting AI know too much about us? I mean, how do we ensure that the ethical development and deployment of AI-based technologies? Absolutely, that's a key consideration um, because as we develop these AI systems that have human perception capabilities, they're gonna have a lot of data about us as users. And it's really important that we really think through how this data is being used. And as you said, we like to think about it in two buckets. One is around the development, the ethical development of AI, and the other is around the deployment of AI. So on the ethical development side, it's all about uh, mitigating data and algorithmic bias. Um, it's really important when we're training these algorithms to detect, say, a smile expression or a brow furrow, that the data is very diverse ethnically diverse, gender diverse, age diverse, but even like contextually diverse, right? Like we need to see people smiling or falling asleep, you know, when they're in their homes, as well as when they're driving or when playing a game or watching video. So the more contexts we are able to represent, um, the, the, the more representative the data is and, and the less likely it's gonna be biased towards any particular subpopulation. So that's really critical, this issue of bias. On the deployment side, it's more about like, how is this technology being used? And um, for us as a company, we have steered away from use cases where people don't know that this data is being collected. For example, in applications around surveillance or security, uh, we as a company have decided that we would not um, really entertain deploying our technologies in these industries. Because I believe that, you know, in, in some of these use cases, uh, people are not aware that that this data is being collected. Um, yeah, so we're huge advocates of this ethical conversation. And in fact, at our summit, which is upcoming um, on the 15th of October in Boston, you're all invited to attend um, the ethical considerations around developing human perception AI is gonna be one of the core themes um, of the summit. So then what questions should AI developers expect to answer related to algorithm transparency and clarity? Yeah, for us, we like to really um, kind of go from the high level abstract conversation of, you know, AI ethics to actual pragmatic, how do I build, you know, AI algorithms that reduce bias? And so what we've done at Affectiva is we've mapped out the machine learning pipeline, if you like, everything from data collection, data acquisition, data annotation, all the way to the training and the validation of these algorithms, and basically develop best practices on how do you mitigate bias at each of these steps. For example, at the data collection stage, you want to make sure that you are collecting data that is diverse across all the dimensions you're interested in, and be very thoughtful about how you quantify that. So if we're you know, collecting data of drowsy drivers, it's important that we have representation of ethnic groups and age groups and genders. And then when you're training these algorithms, it's really important that you sample data that has equal representation of these different subpopulations, right? So if I'm training a smile detector, I wanna make sure that I have Asians in there and Caucasians and, you know, African-Americans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then when we are looking at the um, accuracy results, it's kind of interesting how the machine learning space has evolved over the years. When I was a PhD student over 20 years ago now, um, you just reported one accuracy score. So I would say, oh, my smile detector is 99% accurate. That's not good enough anymore. You have to now report it by these different subpopulations because that's the only way you are able to uncover if there is some bias um, hidden in, in these algorithms. So you can, you know, we look at them very specifically in different age buckets, ethnic groups, and it's, you know, genders to see if there are any accidental biases built into these um, algorithms. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we're very, we're, we're huge advocates of really bringing the AI ethics conversation and reducing it to practice and helping um, machine learning scientists and AI thought leaders and innovators to really implement best practices that help them avoid data and algorithmic bias. All right, Rana, tell us about the Emotion AI Summit. What, what can participants uh, expect to experience? Um, so um, at the Emotion AI Summit, which we're hosting on the 15th of October in Boston, it's a beautiful time of the year uh, to be in Boston actually, because uh, the leaves are just about starting to turn uh, color. 
Um, so the theme is human-centric AI, and it's all about how can AI, uh, as it starts to take on roles that were traditionally done by humans, um, help us be safer, be more productive, be healthier, be more connected and feel more empowered. So it's like turning the AI conversation on its head and really centering around what can AI do for us, right? Each one of us. Um, there will be about 30 speakers lined up from the industry, thought, you know, um, and about 400 business executives in the audience. Um, we take pride in that our event is very, very interdisciplinary and very diverse. It's one of the key things we look at when we're putting the agenda and, and the, uh, you know, the uh, invitations out. Um, so we want it to be a very rich conversation to advance the space of human perception AI. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the ethical considerations. It's actually a thread across the whole event. Um, and we have a number, yeah, a number of thought leaders um, that, that will kind of take us through their thinking and what's happening in the space and some of the opportunities and the challenges. And it's open to everyone, so please, please check out our website, EmotionAISummit.com, and register. Sounds good. Dr. Rana el co-founder and CEO of Affectiva. You mentioned how they can go to the event, but if somebody wants to connect with you and find out more about your company, how can they do that? Um, I am very easy to find online. You can find you can follow me on Twitter at uh, at Kalyubi or on Instagram at Rana El Kalyubi. You can also follow Affectiva um, on Twitter and Instagram as well. All right. Thanks again, Rana. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.